This episode of Distraction is sponsored by Landmark College. Try their free comparison tool for colleges with learning disability support at lcdistraction.org. Landmark College. Learn your way. Succeed uniquely. He's talking too much. He's, you know, distracting other children. He's getting up out of his seat. He's going to sharpen his pencil. Like seven times. Um, <laughs> seven times in one class. Seven times in one class. Oh, sorry, uh, my pencil, pencil just breaks. keeps breaking. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Hello, this is Dr. Ned Hallowell, and welcome to Distraction. Today, we have a very very special show. I know I often say that, but today it's truer than ever. Uh, Really thrilled and honored to have uh, with us two guests from St. Louis, Missouri. They flew in just to do this podcast, and uh, I'm so glad they did. I'll let them tell their story, but just so you know, it's, it's a mom by the name of Chrissy and a son who's 16 years old by the name of Harry. Their last name is Nardini. They live in St. Louis. Um, They also work with Kristen Seymour, who's been on the show before. Uh, And uh, uh, she sort of was instrumental in in bringing them to us. Um, But you'll you'll hear what a pretty amazing story Harry and Chrissy have to tell. And and, uh, uh, I think you'll – well, I I don't want to tell you what you'll – think about it, but <laughs> they wouldn't be here if it weren't uh, worth listening to. So let me, with that as a setup, just uh, let me uh, uh, ask Harry, I just I was just talking to him as we were having lunch, let me uh, ask him to begin by uh, telling us uh, a little bit about the beginning of your life. Uh, well, the beginning of my life uh, started with a little bit of a few struggles in my life. Uh Moving from home to home, home and shelter, not really having much to, like, appreciate. So you were born to a... A single mother. Uh, just kind of lived with whoever she was friends with at the moment. And she family. was how old when you were born? She was 19. Mm-hmm. And she had no job? Uh, no job, really, to, like, keep. Sometimes she'd have one, but it just didn't do enough to... And her, her mother was a crack addict? Her mother was a crack addict. It really affected, I'm, like, I know the way she, she grew up and the way she parented. And she would, her mother would prostitute her to get money to pay for her drug habit? Correct. Yeah. So this is the, the mom you had, uh, 19, homeless, no employment, mm-hmm. uh, an addiction, uh, an addicted grandmother. Mm-hmm. And your father disappeared? My father disappeared, correct. Wow. So, so there you are in St. Louis, mm-hmm. a, a little infant. And who's taking care of you? Uh, kind of, since it was just me and her at the time, it was just kind of just us two against the world. Uh, we would hop around and just hope that someone would help us. And really, that's how it went for the first five years of my life. So your early memories are just of going from... One relative's house to another. And Correct. St- homeless shelters. and mm-hmm. uh, Splots of just bad memories usually. Just like back then I didn't really – like I just was a happy child, didn't really know that it was such a bad area. I remember one time going through with my mom. She was like, uh, just, you know, just kind of a bad area. And I was like, what do you mean? There's nothing wrong with this area. Like back then I just didn't really know that there was – a bigger world out there, much uh-huh. different than uh-huh. what I'm in right now. Uh-huh. Well, it was all black neighborhood? Yeah, all black neighborhood. So not many white people in really. Yeah. No, like every time <laughs> every time I got picked up by them, they're like, oh, they're serious parents. They're, <laughs> they, they knew. I mean, it was just, it wasn't very common for and them. And as a little boy, your babysitter was the television? Oh, uh, yes, yes. The babysitter was the television. Days I didn't go to school, television. And that, was most, that was most days, right? Most and, days, and yeah. uh, also just N- never really at bedtime. I like. I know my brother and sister now. They they don't go to bed. I'll receive Snapchats from two o'clock in the morning watching TV. I'm Just like, why are you still awake? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, I mean, there really wasn't much of a bedtime. Like uh-huh. I said, I've watched Shrek at least forty five times. So you know Shrek, the movie Shrek by heart. By heart, I could cite <laughs> half of the movie. So your, your, your childhood friends were the characters yep. of Shrek. Correct. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> then what happened? How did you meet uh, Chrissy? Well, my aunt was mentored by Chrissy and Mike. So uh, I think I went to a track meet with her one time, and that's how I met them. And I kind of – I don't know if I really clicked instantly with them, but I knew that they had – stuff to offer, and I knew that they were there to help. Yeah. They'd help my aunt, so I knew. Chrissy, can you just introduce yourself? I know Chrissy told me that she's a little self-conscious about talking to them, <laughs> but I reassured her that she has a lovely voice. So. Uh, I'm Chrissy Nardini, and yeah. yes, that's correct. As yeah. uh, Dr. Hollowell said, we met Harry because I was mentoring his aunt. She'd be babysitting him as a teenager, and we got to know him and said, oh, just bring Harry along whenever we picked her up for outings and that sort of thing. Uh huh. And you you run a you and your husband run a business in St. Louis, correct? Uh, we each have our own business. Uh, I run a family business, and he has an IT consulting business. I, I see. So you 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 were fully engaged in work, and and you yeah, we weren't ready to have kids, and so that's what made us start the mentoring. And we picked a group that was a little less of a time commitment than Big Brother Big Sister, thinking that. Uh, we didn't want to overcommit, and then little did we know that, you know, what a path it would take in our life years later. And, and so you saw Harry at a track meet, and how did you? Uh, just kind of remember that he was, like, happy, upbeat, um, in awe of everything he saw, it seemed like. Like, he hadn't been exposed to the world and kind of fell in love with him at first sight. So he anything he got to do with us, whether it was going through a car wash, which he had never done before, mm -hmm. or... Uh, going to the grocery store, different things. He had such enthusiasm and passion for it. It, it was like seeing the world a second time through a child's eyes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then how did you uh, end up bringing him home with you? Well, his mom was struggling. She had two younger children from a from another father, and they were two and one. He was five, six-ish age range and just wasn't able to get him to school every day. So at first, my husband really was the one that convinced me, like, we need to take Harry in and we'll just drive him to school every day. So we approached his mother about it. And because we had helped um, his aunt so much for so many years, she knew us well and she immediately trusted us. And because she was overwhelmed, she agreed and said, sure, you can take him. So he started to live with us and we drove him back to the school district that he was going to um, every day for a semester. Wow. And, and and you remember liking this woman, this blonde white yeah, woman. Who, exactly. Who, who that would, came out of nowhere and just, yeah. yeah. And and my husband, too. Yes, we want to make yes. sure he gets the credit he deserves. <laughs> this good-looking white guy. <laughs> yes, <right>? yes. <laughs> and, and, and so next thing you know, you're living with them. Mm -hmm. Next thing I knew, I was living with them. And it just kind of uh, – I kind of do remember I – kept wanting to I knew that I was being brought down a different path than what at first I was going down and I kind of wanted I remember this I wanted my birth mom to join me I kept asking can my birth mom do this can my birth mom do that can, and yeah I just I knew that it was, my life was about to change mm -hmm. I didn't know how much it was going to change but I knew my life was about to change and I kind of wanted to see her with me but then once I I mean no disrespect to my mom I mean it right. just kind of took off and from there. And, yeah. and so then you started going to a, a school regularly? Yes, school regularly. In Ladue? Meals, yeah, uh -huh. in Ladue. Uh -huh. uh, we, we obtained guardianship so that we could put him in our school district instead uh -huh. of driving him back to the city. And uh, so we enrolled him in Ladue in the school district that we're in. You have a very nice voice, by the way, just so you know that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and and so what was it like to start going to a school regularly? It was a very big change. I, I was – just kind of – at first, I, I'm i fully aware that when I first started going to school in Ladue, I was just like, what is this? What is this? So I just kind of was <laughs> everywhere. Hey, hey, I'm Harry. I don't know if you know. Like just everyone. I was talking to everyone. I was, yeah, just – it was very big difference, very big change every day. And the fact of, that most people were white, was that uh, – That was a – I wouldn't say that was a – I mean it was a very big change. I wasn't used to that. But I mean I could say I didn't – really act the blackest so it right. wasn't really like it wasn't like a big change for me i was still only sick so i wasn't like fully yeah changed but yeah i was i'm okay with it yeah. so you were aware of race but you didn't feel treated differently yeah i didn't feel treated differently at all uh -huh, really. uh -huh. no. and what was the what was school was fun 
School is yeah, fun for me for pretty much the first – Six years. <laughs> but Chrissy, maybe, maybe from your standpoint, you were getting... I think he spent more time having fun uh, than always wanting to sit in his seat and learn. Yeah. He, he was uh, definitely into the social. I mean, he never wanted to miss school. He loved seeing all the kids every day. He was happy, gregarious. He liked the, you know, we had to drop him off for before school care and after school care since we both worked and and i mean those were some of his favorite parts of the day so he he was always a little bit more in tune with all the social aspects of school than uh-huh. than the academic but um he was happy and upbeat to go every day. Uh-huh. Uh, but you would also get calls complaining that he was disruptive? Yeah. I mean, not in a way of like throwing tantrums right. or anything, but of, you know, he's talking too much. He's, you know, distracting other children. He's getting up out of his seat. He's going to sharpen his pencil. Like seven times. Uh, <laughs> seven times in one class. Seven times in one class. Oh, sorry, uh, my pencil, pencil just breaks. keeps breaking. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> losing assignments, uh, not very well organized. And part of it I attributed to, you know, he had never had even a dresser to put his clothes in or, you know, really had a way to be organized. So I wasn't really sure, you know, the lack of organization, what, what that was about. Right. But once you realized that it wasn't just environmental change that this was all about, you brought him for a diagnosis of ADHD, correct? Right. And, um Really weren't sure what to do with that. We probably waited a few months before we went to the pediatrician and they said, showed them the report that we had had done independently. And they said, okay, well, we can prescribe a medication for him. And, and so it began. And we experimented with a few different ones over the years. Mm-hmm. But that was all you got, right? Just the meds. There was no education or coaching? Or, Correct. Uh, yes. Uh-huh. Just, just the medication. Okay. And, and that was through, through school? Up until eighth grade. Wow. So. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, shame on me. I didn't really realize there was more you could be doing about mm-hmm. it. Not shame on you. It's a, a failing of the medical community in general. We don't do a good job of informing people, in fact, informing doctors that there's more to treatment of this uh, than just medication. And first of all, medication doesn't always work. And second of all, education is critical, finding out what it is that, that you have. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, my description is uh, you have a Ferrari engine for a brain. You have a race car for a brain with bicycle brakes, and I'm a brake specialist. And there are many ways to help strengthen those brakes. Medication is one of them. But there are many others, and that's what that's what no one told you about, Chrissy. And, and don't feel – bad about it. As I said, we're, the, the whole profession doesn't do a good job. Most moms out there who have a kid with ADHD end up getting what amounts to a PhD in ADHD because they have to research it on their own. And, and uh, um, for those listening, by the way, there's a wonderful website called understood.org, which you can go to and get all the information you could ever need. It's completely free. It's very up-to-date, very authoritative. Um, if you'd known about that, it would would have helped you enormously. It's a, again a, the the failure is in in our ability to educate the public, and there's a ton of misinformation out there about this condition, about the medications, about the alternative treatments, and so you were you did well to get as far as you did. You got a diagnosis, and and you got some meds. They weren't ideal, but but the big missing link was support and coaching and education and. And but meanwhile, you had Harry, this buoyant, enthusiastic, creative, sparkly, wonderful bundle of positive energy, and that that continued, right? Right. I mean, I I do see. I know I have friends with children with ADHD, and I feel like a lot of them are ready to tear their hair out. I personally saw the gifts that ADHD brings. Right. You know, the empathy, the enthusiasm, the the vibrant personality. So I liked that. I. I guess I thought that maybe the best case scenario was that it had to be squashed during the school day. Mm, and that's what we that's what we definitely don't want to have happen. So there you go. You, you're charismatic. You're handsome. You're athletic. Mm-hmm. Uh, most popular kid in the class. Everybody's following you around. This black kid with all these white kids. Yes. <laughs> you're the yeah. you're the leader of them all. And, mm-hmm. and uh, then you meet uh, Kristen Seymour. The yes. nurse practitioner who wrote a book about uh, ADHD. Tell tell me that story. Uh, well, when I at first when my mom first told me I was going to go talk to her, I just 
I I know one of her. I know her daughter, mm-hmm. and I was at first. I was like, what, "What does she have anything to do with me having ADHD?" I wasn't. Mm-hmm. I wasn't aware that there was more of a story. Uh, so when I talked to her, it really helped me. It gave me someone to talk to, and it just yeah, it really changed. I knew that that you can still become successful and have ADHD. I always thought of ADHD is just like something I always had to overcome. That. Like, I thought it was going to be a problem for the rest of my life. But. So Kristen switched your perspective from feeling bad about it yes. to telling you there's a tremendous upside to mm-hmm. this. And, and that's, yes. uh, the, that's the education part that had been missing. Mm-hmm. And what difference did that make to you? That that made me, like, it gave me the, the thought that I can still do things even with ADHD. And now I'm pushing and trying way harder because I know that I can still – succeed even with the ADHD. So that was a real turning point, meeting Kristen, mm-hmm. reading her book, finding out that she had struggled as well, yes. and, and seeing how happy and successful mm-hmm. she is. And, um, and, and Yeah, go ahead, Kristen. And I, as a mom, you know, not having ADHD, right. I, you know, some of the impulsive acts he would do, you know, I couldn't understand. Right. I mean, and I felt like if I tell him to, to other non-ADHD people, we both didn't understand and didn't approve in general, you know, if they were impulsive things that were negative. Um, She was the first person I talked to that I felt like, while she wouldn't approve, of course, of something impulsive that he shouldn't have done, she understood it. And having there be somebody that could hear a crazy story of impulsive behavior and not go, what? How could you do that? You know, made me feel like, okay, there is method to the madness and there is a, a route to him still being a su- successful working adult. Yeah, until you know, until you understand ADHD, it's almost invariable that you make what I call the moral diagnosis. You're not trying hard enough. You're being disobedient. And then you punish him or lecture him. And you can say to someone with ADHD, take out the trash. And he will say, okay. And he'll walk right past the trash. And, and you think he's being All the time. disrespectful or disobedient. And you say, get yourself back here. He literally, in the time it takes for him, he's agreeing to take out the trash. The time it takes for him to walk to the trash, he's forgotten. About I'll just trash. keep walking around. I walk yeah. a circle. I'm like, what yeah. was it you yeah, told exactly, me to do? Exactly. I'm <laughs> holding a trash bag. I'm going to assume it's a trash can, but what if it's not? <laughs> what if it's just a Yeah, what if it's like – Magic sack. Exactly, right, exactly. Right, right, right. So, so, so instead of punishing him, which is the natural instinct, you, what do you mean? You said you do it and you walked right past it. Once you understand this – fascinating condition. You you still got to get him to take out the trash. It's not like a get out of jail free card. But instead of getting punishing him, you say, hey, buddy, you forgot. Remember? He says, oh, yeah. You know, that's what the sack yes. is for. And, you know, and, and uh, um, that makes such a difference. Yes. Because then, then he doesn't feel, see, the damage it's, that gets done is the damage to self-esteem where he feels, why am I always failing? Why am I always being corrected? Why can't I remember things that other people would? And that's the message he's getting from parents and teachers. But now that you understand it, mm-hmm. it still can be incredibly frustrating because yes. you're forgetting things all the time. But you're out of the moral diagnosis that you're a bad, disobedient, yes. disrespectful, out of getting punished and shamed and reprimanded. And instead, you're Developing strategies to do the things that you you know you should do and and, and want to do. Yes, and 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 so Kristen was really helpful in in your understanding that, and you you as well, Chrissy. Right, right. Yeah. understanding that you can really thrive with the right tools of ADHD, and you know just a simple trip uh, tips and tricks from. Remembering things, ways to get his mind to calm, to go to sleep at night, um, you know, what he should be doing first thing in the morning, you know, those types of things. And that's really true, you know, thriving. It's like you're an X-Man. You were born Mm -hmm. with very special talents. But you need special training to develop them. Develop them. And, and, uh, but, you know, you, you have the charisma. You have the uh, good looks. You have the uh, uh, native creativity, intuition, intelligence, you know. That, and, and then as you strengthen your brakes, you know, you'll be able to do even better. So this year, with the help of Kristen and some medication adjustment, you got on an even better track, correct? Uh-huh. Tell us about what's happening this year now that you're in ninth grade. Well, now that I'm in ninth grade, uh, I've gotten way better at not just being like it's daycare. It's it's more of a school. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it's it's helped me just control control more. I went from like getting 
phone calls home, emails home to – I don't think she's gotten any this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, disciplinary phone calls. Yeah, yeah disciplinary yeah, phone yeah. calls. Uh, and uh, we have a demerit system. I only have one demerit. I mean, that's that's very good for what I came from uh, from <laughs> every day. And the one demerit was from being two minutes late? Yeah, two minutes late to a class. <laughs> so, like, it's a very big difference than what I used to getting up every other class just to – just go sharpen a pencil. Right. Really just go say hi to a friend. I mean, right. Yeah, right. I would have had usually several calls home, never for anything that was, you know, wanting to take him to a counselor or something right. that I thought there was like a mental problem, but right. just stuff of he's too talkative, he's disruptive, he's getting right. out of his seat, all the kids are looking at him, that sort of thing. Race car brain with bicycle brakes. Right. Your brakes weren't yeah. quite strong enough. Right. And you've also become uh, sort of an influence for helping people kind of do the right thing. T- tell us about the Juul story. First of all, tell people what a Juul is because a lot of listeners won't know. A Juul is an uh, electric cigarette. So it's uh, hitting almost every high school I know, it, at least in St. Louis. So that's that's a big thing in St. Louis, and a lot of kids are doing it. So the biggest thing is uh, kids are trying to do things challenging for like a month. I said, let's try to do No Jewel January, and a lot of kids questioned me on it, and now they're like, okay, let's try it. And so a bunch of kids are going to try to do No Jewel January and not Jewel for the entire month of January. Hopefully influencing them not to Jewel ever because, I mean, I've uh, we've talked about something saying after like five days or something like that, you could – it's very easy to stop after you hit the five days. So I'm hoping if kids can actually make it 30, then they won't Jewel ever again. And what's your sales pitch? Uh, just no jewel January. I mean, uh-huh, uh-huh. Don't and, jewel. and the fact that you're a leader in the class, they're likely to listen to you, not just say, "Oh, you're being a goody goody." Yeah, you're, I can at least get five kids to do it, and there's five kids that stop jeweling. And he, they, he got a group of several kids that all flushed them down the toilet. Wow, wow, that's so impressive. You know how. How many people who tackle the issue of uh, drug use in, in adolescence mm-hmm. would pay to replicate what you're doing? And you just it just came to you that you're you want to lead by example, mm-hmm. and you have their respect, so they don't think you're kissing up or yeah, trying to kissing up or yeah, trying to yeah. yeah. You just think it you'll be better off if you if you don't become addicted to nicotine mm-hmm. or anything else for that anything matter. Anything else, yeah. yeah. And where did you get that idea? Well, I've been told multiple times uh, because I I don't do it. So uh, I've been told multiple times that addiction runs in my family. So I know that addiction can be very – like it can pull you down. I mean if you want to – let's just use Jewel for example. If you want to Jewel instead of go get better at football, mm-hmm, something like that, mm-hmm. then – there goes you're dropping lower in football. Mm-hmm. I mean, it can help if you're not addicted to something to succeed because that's going to drag you down. You bet your life. And and uh, the fact that someone had told you, I mean, obviously your grandmother was a crack mm-hmm. addict, that, that you have a particularly vulner- vulnerability to mm-hmm. addiction. Yeah, and you, addiction can be inherited. It sure is. Mm-hmm. And, so, and you took that seriously and thought mm-hmm. about it. And did Kristen Seymour talk to you about that too? Yes. Yes. Uh, that's great. And how did she get through to you? Uh, being relatable. I know she's gone through a lot. A lot of things have happened with her. So I, I can relate to it. I mean, it's very different than if a doctor that's come up to you and you know they've just been succeeding their entire life. Nothing bad has ever happened to them came up to you and it was like, I mean, yeah, you should be able to do that. Like it's just very different than someone that can relate to you. You know that they've, they've come from where you've come from. It's just very different. So instead of lecturing you. Mm-hmm. Instead of a lecture, it's like you know they've lived it. She's been there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What a difference. So that was a – your advice to others who would mm-hmm. talk to kids is please don't lecture us. <laughs> please don't lecture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and instead find us someone like Kristen Seymour mm-hmm. who, who can relate to us. Yes. And that we can relate to. Yeah. yeah. And you're, you're leading – this ninth grade class at uh, in St. Louis, by example, uh-huh. that's that's you must be pretty proud, Chrissy. Yeah, because um, he made a couple questionable choices uh, in the past 
at the end of eighth grade, and I was a little worried if he was getting off track and, uh, you know, the impulsiveness and the being on the wrong medication. Mm -hmm. The the stakes are much higher when you're, you know, as you get to be a teenager, impulsive behavior. Mm -hmm. When it's, you know, impulsive behavior is young, maybe they write on the wall with a crayon or something. When they're impulsive as a teenager, it's more serious. So um, seeing him make the good choices and, and work on scripting and having answers when, you know, temptations are put in front of them. And knowing that a lot of kids do look up to him and, and listen to him and he's a leader uh, makes me really proud. And what is your motivation to do the right thing? Just like almost just wanting to succeed and wanting other people to succeed. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, – it just kind of feels good knowing that some other person is like going better, like getting better in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just wonderful. It, I can tell you're – very sincere about that. Uh -huh. You know, you, you, you feel good when you see other people feeling uh -huh. good and, and on the way to, you know, trying to do the right thing. Uh -huh. Do you have long-term ambitions? Do you have any – I mean, you're only in the ninth grade, so – Not really, but I feel like every child that's an athlete or plays sports has the same thing. I want to go professional in that sport. Uh -huh. but, like, so you yeah, could, that'd be you, great. You, but, could, you could play – Cornerback for the new St. Louis Rams. Or the <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, but like, yeah, this reminder, you want to go to college. Yes, yeah, so I want to go to college. Uh, and like, and you do want to go to college. You're not yeah, just saying that. Yes, yeah, I yeah, do okay. want to go to college. Okay. Uh, my big goal in life is just succeed, like make it further than yeah. I was expected to go. Yeah. You also told me when we were talking, you have dyslexia, which I also have. So you mm -hmm. and I are both slow readers. Mm -hmm. um, and I was uh, saying to you, don't worry, you know, it doesn't have to hold you back. Mm -hmm. uh, the, a lot of people have misconceptions about what these things mean. Many people are told you can't go to medical school if you have ADD or dyslexia. Well, I have both of them. And I have many doctor patients who have them both. I mean, there, there's nothing you can't do mm -hmm. if you have these conditions. It's just a matter of finding the right person to help you. Yes. And, and, and really, both of these conditions, ADHD and dyslexia, are markers of talent. Mm -hmm. Most people who have them have particular talents. And uh, yeah. we face particular challenges, yes, like you and I are slow readers. But so what? You know, you, we also have special talents, you know, and, and you, you will – I guarantee you the, the, the biggest enemy is, is, is thinking you can't do something. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's just a matter of finding the right help to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. Yes. You're an amazing kid and you've got an Thank amazing you. mom, an amazing family. I mean the, you were plucked out of you know a terrible situation. Mm -hmm. and, um, but you've stayed in touch with your birth mother and mm -hmm. her children, correct? Correct. Yeah. And, and – do you have a good relationship with them? I have a good relationship with them. They can be a little crazy. Your little brother? Both, both little brother and little sister. They're, it's because, like, they haven't hit the civilized point yet. <laughs> like, I have. It's, they're a little, little crazy, but they I haven't mean, hit the civilized. Yes, point yet. yes, the civilized point. They're still a little crazy, but uh, yeah, it's just. I think he has compassion because he knows his mom did the best she could. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is she still struggling? Is she still? Uh, she's been drug free for drug two free years. Drug free for two mm -hmm. years, and but she's still unemployed. Yes, uh -huh. homeless. No, no, no. not homeless. No. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How do you feel about that? That you're on your way to a whole different kind of life. It's a lot to it's a lot to take in. Uh, but I mean, I'm fully okay with it. Mm -hmm. uh, just I. I really think it's made you too. appreciative. Yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate it a lot. Uh, but you don't feel guilty. No, no, not really. And how about? I mean, look at the differences you have from your peers. You're black. Mm -hmm. You're adopted. Mm -hmm. You have ADHD and dyslexia. And dyslexia, yes. How does what impact does that have on you? Uh, a lot of people actually do not know. Like some kids are even shocked when I tell them I'm adopted. I'm like, oh, that's just that's just the front of it. I mean, you don't know about the you used to be homeless, you know, this, that. There's a bunch of other things, but it just it really it just helps me when I think about like when people are like why why did why this why that. It just feels better because I know it's 
it wasn't all given to me. It wasn't all just here you go, here you go, here you go. It's uh, I far, had to, far from it. Yeah. yeah. The only difference Push anyone forward. can see is that you're black. Yes. And thank God we live in a country now where that's yes. not a, a stigmatizing <laughs> thing, yeah. at, at least not as much as it once was. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the others are invisible. Nobody can see that you used to be homeless. Nobody yeah. can see that your grandmother yes. was a crack addict. Nobody mm-hmm. can see that you yeah. have – ADHD and yeah, dyslexia. Just, Although, if, you, if they, I would say, if they could see it, they'd be jealous because they're wonderful things to have if you manage them right. <laughs> but um, not that you have advice. But what, what would you say to the people listening to this podcast? We have all different kinds of people who, who tune into this, mm-hmm. and I imagine most of them are saying, "What an impressive young man!" But beyond their being impressed, what would you like them to learn from you? I mean, it's one thing to say, wow, that's impressive. But what do you do with that other than admire you? What, what, what would you like them to? That's a big question. Uh, I Would you like them to know that what you did pretty much anyone can do? Yes, exactly. Like as long as you really push to actually – like if you want to get better, you can get better. Mm-hmm. Uh like my situation, yeah, it's a it's a very big situation. It's it's changed my life a tremendous amount. But like even a small situation, as long as you push to try to do better, as long as you want to, you can. I mean, I, and something about your positive attitude attracted Chrissy. Uh-huh. You know, because we will say, well, he was lucky he found Chrissy, but she was drawn to you for some reason. Uh-huh. And it it seems to be directly related to your positive energy. He's always upbeat. He's always, uh, I mean, from the first day of first grade when he'd come home from school every day, how was school? He'd always say, good, good. How was the party? Good, good. How was uh, chores? Good. I mean, he his answer to everything was always good. He never really complained and had a bad day. And, and you've just always been like that, huh? Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, even when, like, we're in a bad situation. I mean, at least we have music. I mean, uh-huh. car breaks down. At least we have music. I mean, there's always there's always something that can be good in a situation. And yeah, you, you should write a book someday called "At Least We Have Music." At least we have music. <laughs> you know, at least we have music. You know, that's uh... well, Harry. I can't tell you and Chrissy. My gosh, how honored uh, I am to have you on this podcast. You have to make a promise that. You'll come on again. You don't have to come all the way from St. Louis, but you can do it over the telephone. Okay. Because I think all of our listeners would like to sort of check in with both of you from time to time right. and, and sort of follow you on your journey. Um, whether I, it, I feel grateful that I get to watch his journey. You know, well, I feel like I'm getting to witness something. Yeah. Say it. Go ahead. Yeah. She's choking up a little <laughs> bit, which is which is completely understandable. It's a pretty amazing Here's a give your mom a clean. <laughs> but you're doing more than witnessing it. You're momming it. <laughs> <laughs> He's a gifted kid, and I've told uh, him that. Yeah. And it's, it's fun to watch him thrive. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, uh, you know, for, all, for everyone listening, if you want to uh, send in any comments or questions, we can relay them to Harry and Chrissy. Um, I think this has been a special interview. It certainly has been for me. And I guess what I'd like people listening to take away aside from how impressive Harry and Chrissy are is that what's at work in here is is the power of knowledge, the power of connection, the power of getting the right help and how important it is not to give in to negativity and giving up and uh, thinking, well, you know, there's just no hope. Because at, at one point, if somebody looked at you, they would have said there's no hope for that yeah, kid. Like if it was written and like if it was a live, I'd say a live movie and you're watching it at the point of before I hit, before I met them, you'd be yeah. like, oh, this kid. It, yeah. No, no way. Hope. Yeah. He'll have a life of drugs and mm-hmm. early, early death or yep, crime. Early death. Yeah, yeah. We just got a new police chief and they said we're going to concentrate on this certain area of St. Louis. And it's the area where his mother lives now. And mm-hmm. it's where 67 percent of last year's murders took mm-hmm. place. And it's not going to be fixed by locking more people up. No. You know, it's going to be fixed by education. Changing, all, like, the people in the area. Yeah, and having people do a no jewels January. <laughs> Jewel-free January. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank so, you. Chrissy, do you have any messages for listeners that you'd like to? Just um, 
if you're a parent that is frustrated with ADHD, you know, it is a gift and when it's managed properly mm-hmm. and um, finding the tools. I probably didn't do enough soon enough, but finding the tools really makes a difference in helping those gifts thrive. Yeah. yeah. And finding someone like Kristen who the person can relate to and, yes. and understand. And not just stopping with medication as if that's all there is to it. Right. So much more to it. Well, goodness me. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, that was one of the more memorable interviews I've ever done, and what a what a pleasure, honor, treat, uh, special gift to have Harry and Chrissy Nardini with us. Uh, Harry, a ninth grader who is the chairman of the Jewel Free January Society. Uh, the most effective drug prevention program I've ever encountered in my entire life. Um, and uh, Chrissy Nardini, a mom from heaven, with a husband from heaven as well, who wasn't here today, but he was here in spirit, Mike. And uh, honest to goodness, uh, um, it just, it, my feeling in listening to them was just, this is what the world and this country needs to hear. These messages that are real, they're not slogans, and they're, they're not out of a cookbook, and they're not out of some bureaucratic policy manual. They're out of the heart, and uh, they're coming from people who want to do what they can do to make a difference, and then they do it. And look at the good. I mean, Harry couldn't have had more strikes against him. I mean, uh, he, he was in poverty, coke addict, grandmother, no place to live, uh, homeless, relying on the kindness of strangers and welfare. And anybody would have said there's there's just no hope for him, and and he would have been another statistic. And uh, and then something happened, you know, uh, uh, out of nowhere. Chrissy, because she was tutoring, uh, got to see him at a soccer game and thought, what's up with that boy? And one thing led to another, and now Harry has a whole new life. And and to the point where he is leading other kids and and saying how much how good he feels when he knows they're living life better and these are kids who who are way more privileged than than he ever was and he is leading them and now how do you set that up how do you set that up well i think it comes back to the power of connection the natural feeling of wanting to help that one person develops for another person Chrissy for Harry, now Harry for his classmates, um, uh, the wonderful Kristen Seymour who got involved and facilitated uh, helped more of the change. It's all about connecting positive energy with knowledge uh, and leading to not just good results, spectacular. I want to say miraculous, but they're not miraculous because we know how it happened. And uh, if only more community cities people could hear this story and realize it is absolutely replicatable by putting more emphasis on the positive energy and activating that positive energy one person at a time. Well, I am so pleased to have had this conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Please get in touch with us with your comments You can email us at connect at distractionpodcast.com or call and leave a message at 844-55-CONNECT. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate those reviews. We listen to them. Please keep them coming. If you like this show in particular, please give us comments uh, about it. We'd like to do more like these and and uh, you know this is a community we're creating so we need your active participation to make it a vibrant community uh, much as uh, Harry and Chrissy are doing in St. Louis along with with Kristen Seymour Distraction is produced by Collisions the podcast division of CRN International Collisions podcasts for curious people Our producer is Sarah Gurton, who came in today even having fallen down the stairs last night because she was so determined to make sure she could greet our guest today, and now she's off to the hospital to get an x-ray. And our sound engineer is Scott Person, the absolute genius at sound engineering. And our music theme was created by the invisible, never-seen-before Mark Berman. This is Dr. Ned Hallowell. Thank you very much. (laughs) 